Oh, hello everybody, this is the Bible Live with Jeremiah. Um, I was about to start the book of Revelation, but I might be going somewhere um, either tonight or tomorrow. And while there's, I think, 24, no, 21 chapters in Revelation, that's certainly not enough time to allow for me to do it in one shot. Um, let me find it. Sorry, I just got in. We were... Um, chasing a rooster around the yard who attacked one of my puppies very hard so he's running around screaming right now he about had a heart attack uh, just chasing him to make him be scared because uh, I'm a little tired of him. he's been getting rougher with them so you know they're little guys they gotta learn the uh, the yard but it's uh, it's not in my respect polite enough for that rooster to be attacking them but you know when you're the only rooster in the yard I imagine you want to you know ensure your place but I'm slightly out of breath we might start Revelation anyway I, uh, I would like to start one and go through it completely um, maybe we'll do James Actually, no, I apologize. I think the better ones would be to hit the epistles of Peter. Um, there's, I believe, two. Second epistle. I'm just checking how many we have chapter-wise. Okay, so that would be like a total of maybe eight, eight chapters. So roughly an hour and 20 minutes per se to do them. Depending on how much interruptions we have. So we're going to start with Peter then. Um, I, I don't know. Obviously I don't know the um, biblical knowledge of the audience. And I don't ever mean to try to sound holier than thou. Or um, talking down to you. Or you know floating your boat. Um, but I do want to give at least a relevant small overview of things before I engage them. Um, Peter is renowned historically as being the, uh, the, the leader of the church in its beginning, uh, typically associated with the Church of Jerusalem, I believe. Um, there was a separation between him and Paul uh, for a little bit in the sense that Peter, when he was working on the church and building a church in the faith of Christ, uh, he believed it was for the Jews because the kingdom had always been promised to that point as far as they knew to the Jews. And even though the prophets had said that there would be the Gentiles and that Christ would be the light of the Gentiles as well, um, Jewish tradition to this point had never respected that. Matter of fact, the, um, there was a separation of the Jews when they went into, I forget which period, but uh, the Maccabean period or... Anyway, um, a lot of Jews were taken into Babylon, and there were those that stayed behind. And they became looked at as being not Jews. Uh, and they became, um, I forget what they're called, but when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, she would be one of those. How is that you a Jew speak to me? Uh, I, I do apologize, I don't remember, but you'll be able to Google it or figure it out, typically, unless you know you have no access to that and this has already been downloaded or recorded to your device or a computer. But um, there was, a, I'm going to say, a racial divide within the Jews in that respect. But to this point when Peter is founding the church in a sense 
He's doing so on the basis that the promise belongs exclusively to the Jews. And I think it may have been the book of Acts. I'm not sure. No, um, I think it was one of Paul's writings. Paul, who was converted on the road to Damascus, and we covered him in the introduction to Ephesians, he withstood Peter. In other words, face-to-face -face conversation, a debate. Paul is stout. I believe he was referenced to be a little bit of a shorter fellow. But you're not changing his mind. Not unless you have a good enough argument. He's uh, renowned for his intelligence, his wit, and his ability to acclimate his argument to the case. And um, so he corrected Peter that scripture indicates and promises the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles as well. And, and the reason this is, is because Peter, by tradition, was having people um, circumcised in order to receive, um, I'd say, the acceptance into the community. And the Gentiles were uncircumcised. So this was, again, one of those promised things that gets a little confusing. So the Gentiles, because they were uncircumcised, were considered unclean. And they weren't allowed to receive the Holy Spirit. But Paul let them know the difference. And that, yes, the Gentiles, too, can receive the Holy Spirit. And after Peter had been won over and actually agreed, this is when Paul went to Rome, in a sense. This is when he began a whole nother um, structure to the church. Uh, and um, Peter's side was for the Jews. They worked within that sort of a community. Now obviously this sort of history is not something that any of us can factually put down, set in stone, and go and say this, 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 and this. But the overall, the overall is that Peter and uh, his uh, participating um, church membership worked within the Jewish communities. They did accept Gentiles, but it was not as strong as Paul's, whereas Paul's almost entire church structure and inclusion was Gentiles. He's the one who writes to the Romans and to the Corinthians. And so he went to all these educated, intelligent people in the world, in a sense, who thought they were higher than everybody else. They had the Grecian myths and all these other things. There's uh, one reference, I think it's where Paul and Barnabas are at um, perhaps the Mount of Mars, I don't remember, but there's all these lineup of gods that they have and then they've got one called the Unnamed God. And I'm hoping it was Paul because I hope I didn't get the, the wrong apostles in there. But um, he wins the crowd over, you know, they're all for it, and then later on they want to kill him. It's, you know, it, it's a strange thing to be an apostle in those days. Because basically, you could walk the streets, and at every corner somebody was preaching this idol, or preaching that idol. You know, in a sense, you could have somebody holding up a stick saying, here is God, and somebody holding up a stone saying, here is God. And, you know, you could just keep walking down the road and all these different bottles of different colored water in a, in, in a parable sort of style would be representing this spirit or that spirit or this entity or that entity. And so what I wanted to get to is that there was an argument between Peter and Paul, and... Um, so it shows that yes, we can disagree, and we can be proven wrong. And sometimes we need to be corrected because we're wrong. I'll be honest, because I rant on all these videos, and none of it is written down prior to me doing it, I'm making a great error in that I may be permitting mistakes to be spoken. So. I really ask that if you recognize the mistakes, you comment below. Don't go yelling at me or nothing like that. I'm not trying to start a war. But if you recognize the mistake, please put it down below. And if I, um, if I have internet access and I come across that, I will try to put a, um, a, 
a caption or something at the beginning of the video or fix the description, something to correct what I've stated. I, I, I remember earlier I stated something wrong, but I forgot what it was and I couldn't fix it then. But, um, so going forward, um, they had their argument, they got it figured out, and the church was then the church of the Jews and the Gentiles, and this is where all the writings come in that we are neither Jew nor Greek nor barbarian, nor slave, nor rich, nor poor. And this is when we really start to realize that we belong to Christ, not to a race, not to a city, not to this population or that community. Um, we all have a community interest no matter where we live. There are some things that are going to be universal in their aspect and application. We all need food, we all need some place to live, we all need some place to sleep. Those are universal aspects. But then there are things that are above the universal equations and that would be something like this where we belong to Christ and not ourselves and so when we have that sort of a revelation between these two characters the church really began to understand itself and it got away from all the Old Testament in its more keeping the law tradition and it became more of the spirit of the law that is alive and as Christ put it I will write my word in your heart. And I say Christ because the scripture tells us um, that holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And uh, elsewhere that we do not follow false fables or cunningly crafted, you know, basically we're not following stuff that's made up. We are re... almost everything's an oral tradition. In our case, we have two things. The oral tradition at the beginning of the church was when the apostles went out and they developed small communities of the church. The church is all of us, but the small communities where they were listening to the word being repeated to them, which would be like basically the four gospels in a sense. And then as people requested, I believe it was the book of Mark was the first one written down. And that's because I believe it was Greeks or Romans or something of that sort who who didn't understand you know Jewish tradition so they wanted not to understand the Jewish tradition but to to um, have a record of what um, I believe Mark was writing for Peter I don't remember but one of the Apostles preached and uh, before he left they were like please write this down for us so that you know because if you're not Jewish you don't ascertain what they're talking about entirely even if you understand in your heart what's being said and so they were like please give us a record of what was written or what was said so that we can study it and, and you know spend some time with it and, and basically come to a better relationship with what was spoken and that was kind of the first beginning of the New Testament and so later there, there were other I think Mark was the most circulated at the time. Historical evidence proves that I believe there was uh, actually thousands of manuscripts of Mark. Um, there's this is debatable. There's a lot of scrutiny on both sides of the border. You know, people trying to disprove, people trying to prove. We're not getting into all that, but uh, it has been stated that you could virtually republish the entire New Testament based on the letters written. I mean, if the Bible disappeared, you could virtually put it back together from all the letters written to different people, you know, if they were in higher offices or wherever they were, who had basically been writing back and forth and repeating the gospel through the tradition of writing. So it's like, you get this, then you copy it and send it off to your brother over here or to your sister over there. And that's 
what happened like wildfire was the scriptures went everywhere. And I forget which, uh, which Caesar it was. So, uh, one of the, one of the higher-ups basically said they've taken over. Uh, the, the Christians, the Christians sort of took over because it was on everybody's mind. And um, I don't know at what point Nero was persecuting the church. I don't know at what point, but I, I, I kind of recall perhaps that at the same time the book of Revelation was written was during that time period. Now, I'm not a biblical historian. I've just read it a lot. Um, and I've spent time expressing the the essence of things. Not, not really the technical, but the essence. And... Um, but all of that said, we're going to start the book of Peter, or the first epistle of Peter. Now, epistles are when the apostle, or in some cases a disciple, or somebody working for a disciple like Paul, had very bad eyes, and he could not write for himself. There is a letter that he signs and says, I have written this myself. Basically, in a sense, because he loved these people so much that he wanted to make sure it was his hand that wrote that letter. But he was basically very bad sighted and had to have somebody write for him. And that was one of the most educated people of his, t of his day. So he knew how to write, but he couldn't really facilitate it himself. And uh, you'll see in other places that uh, at the same time, not everybody in those days could read and write. So again, you know, Peter was a fisherman. Maybe he didn't know how to. So one of his disciples wrote for him. So anyway, we are now going to pause. That was the introduction to the epistle of Peter. And by introductions, I'm not doing intros to what's being written to the church. It's more along the lines of the person. And if I've already introduced that person, then we might give you some more information depending on which book we're in. Or we might just dive right into it. So uh, we're going to pause here, and then we're going to start the first epistle of Peter.